Have you ever been here before? You're just trying to learn how to make a better cup of coffee and all of a sudden you're going down the rabbit hole of fractal geometry and renormalization group theory. Okay, well, maybe that's just me, but today you're gonna join me on that journey, I hope. You see, I do love a good espresso, but I have a bit of a problem, namely that I'm just not very good at making it. Just ask anyone I've ever had over for a cup of coffee. There's a lot that goes into making a cup of joe. The beans, the temperature, and for today's video, the most important thing, how tightly you pack in the grinds. Too dense and you get nothing too loose and you get Tim Hortons really diluted watery coffee. It turns out this problem of finding the perfect coffee density can be directly translated to a well-known problem in physics, namely that of percolation theory. Percolation theory is a starting point for some of the most important concepts in all of science. Phase transitions, criticality, fractals, renormalization group theories, and the mind-blowing ramifications of universality. These concepts are used everywhere, from the theoretical world of quantum field theories to biology, neuroscience, financial markets, disease spreading, social networks, and information spreading, and so much more. But I don't really care about any of that. I just want a good cup of coffee. Today, we'll start our journey into some of these concepts by taking a look at a simple toy model of how I can improve my espressos. Even though the model itself is simple, don't let its simplicity fool you. The saying might be keep it simple stupid, but simple is not stupid, nor is it easy, but it is immensely rewarding. So let's get started. In order to capture the basics of coffee making, we need at least two ingredients, the grinds and water, which are going to be represented by this orangey square and blue circle respectively. This two ingredient model does overlook something though, namely that what we call coffee is actually the result of the interaction between these two ingredients. The water is infused with the oils picked up from the grains. However, for everything we talk about today, this doesn't really change anything and only adds unneeded complexity to the problem and my animations. Our coffee brewing simulation is going to go something like this. We'll make a grid of coffee grinds and randomly insert holes. The amount of holes will represent the density of the packing. The denser it is, the less holes, and vice versa. This density will be set by a number between 0 and 1 that we get to choose. If the density is 1, then there are no holes, but if the density is 0, then there's no grinds. Finally, we need water, which just fills the holes. That's it, that's our model. I'll link the code I made to do the analysis in this video in the description, and you can see for yourself that really this is all there is to it. It really is that simple. Admittedly, I wouldn't blame you if you thought it was too simple, but I do wanna emphasize that the artificial grid of tiles we have is just a simplification for teaching. It's not actually necessary. Talking a little more generally, we can think of the grid as a network where the nodes are connected to their adjacent neighbors, but they don't have to be. If instead of thinking about how water spreads through coffee grinds, we wanted to talk about how, for example, rumors and gossip spread throughout a school, we would use a network made from the social links between students and look at how information spreads from one to another. These aren't hypothetical examples either. Real research has been done on similar topics and it turns out the math is almost exactly the same. So as artificial as it may seem, we'll stick with the simpler grid example for now. We have water and we have coffee grinds. Are we done? Well, not necessarily. If we pack the grinds in too dense, we'll just have small clusters of water that are stuck and can't flow out. What we need is percolation. If you've ever made coffee, then you've probably heard of the term percolation, which just means that water is trickling through the grinds. For us, this means that there's a connected cluster of water forming a path from one side of the grid to the opposite, kind of like this. The idea is that percolation allows for a path that the water can take to flow out. With a grid of three by three, here are just some examples of the ways that we can form a percolating path. In order to learn how to make the best tasting cup of coffee, what we really need to do is learn more about these percolating clusters and how their formation depends on the density. Because it's important, whenever it's relevant to the discussion, I'll emphasize water tiles that belong to the percolating cluster by making them bigger than those that don't. Remember though, this is a probabilistic model, so we need to consider only those properties that hold true for a given density, and not the particular arrangement, or what we'll call configuration of tiles. For example, these configurations have the same number of coffee grinds and water tiles. 
meaning they have the same density. But the way they're arranged is very different. In one case the water is percolating, and in the other it's not. So rather than asking when will the water percolate, we instead need to look at averages and probabilities and ask, at what density are we guaranteed in a statistical sense for percolating clusters to form? Unfortunately, it's here where we run into a bit of a problem. Namely, that the question doesn't actually make sense. Taking a step back, we might even ask why would we think that there's even a single density at which percolating clusters start to form? Like, take this grid of 3 by 3 for example. Of course, if the density is low, then we're always going to have a percolating cluster. But even if the density is very high, say 0.9, it's not that hard for a percolating cluster to form just by sheer luck. All we really need is at least three water tiles in a row, and there's several ways that we could do that. To make this a little more concrete, let's plot the probability that there's a percolating path as we change the density. For each density between 0 and 1, I do 1000 random realizations of the 3x3 three three grid, and count how many of those were percolating, which gives us an estimate for the probability. Hopefully, this looks more or less exactly what you would expect. If the density is low, then the water makes it through pretty easily, and the probability to percolate is very high. If the density is high, then the probability to percolate is very low. It's hard for the water to make it through. But at no point would I really say that there's a density at which percolation is impossible. Because of this, the original question, at what density are we guaranteed to have a percolating cluster, doesn't have a clear answer, nor does it really make sense. What we're seeing here is something physicists like to call a finite size effect. The question doesn't really make sense because the number of elements is so small that the actual geometry of the problem is an important factor in the result. Personally though, I like to call this the not enough coffee effect. Who in their right mind would make coffee with just 9 grinds? By my estimation, a standard basket of espresso holds on the order of tens of millions of grinds. If the problem is that we can't answer the question because we just don't have enough coffee, which is admittedly a problem I run into a lot, let's just add in more and see what happens. Here's the same curve for increasingly more grinds. Can you see how the plots seem to get sharper around this point as we add in more coffee? For the largest amount, the graph seems to be almost like a step. Zero everywhere above this point and one everywhere below it. In fact, if we had an infinite amount of coffee, this is exactly what it would be. Zero, and then an instantaneous increase to one, with nothing in between. Below this density, we're guaranteed that water will be able to pass, and above it, we're guaranteed that the water will get stuck, regardless of the actual amount of coffee that we have. To talk a little more broadly, what we have here is a phase transition. For the purposes of this video, we'll treat it as meaning a particular state of the system. So we have a no coffee phase where the grinds are too densely packed, and the percolating phase where water is allowed through. The point that separates the two phases is what we call the critical density. More generally, if we have some parameter that we can tune that isn't explicitly a density, we can call it a critical point. For example, 0 degrees Celsius is the critical temperature at which water transitions from its ice phase to, well, its water phase. But there's so many more examples. Forest fire spreading could be modeled as a critical phenomena. If it's just rain, then a fire can't start. But if it's too dry, then a fire percolates through the entire forest, like water percolates through the grinds. This means that there's a critical uh, wetness that delineates the boundary between the two. This might be a bit of a stretch, but I think we can even see these concepts in resource systems and games. The resources lost relative to the resources gained per encounter, or what we might call the scarcity, is like a parameter that the developers can tune to reach an ideal flow for the given game. We've kind of deviated away from talking about coffee, so let's go back to it, but this is one of the things I really like about percolation theory. It's a springboard. And once you start seeing these concepts in one place, it's hard not to see them all around you in your everyday life. Let's take a closer look at the critical density itself. We'll do this more rigorously in a second, but to set up some of the intuition, I think it helps to flip the graph that we had before. Instead of looking at the probability to percolate as a function of the density for different amounts of coffee, let's look at it as a function of the amount of coffee for different densities. If the density is high, then the percolation probability goes to zero as we add in more coffee. But if the density is low, then it goes to 1 very quickly. 
at the critical point, what we get is a straight line separating the two phases. It's a 50-50 chance to percolate. No matter how much bigger we make the system, everything looks functionally the same. There's no change at all. And I feel like there's a word for something that doesn't change as you keep zooming in and out of it. As it turns out, we can formalize the notion of zooming out using what has to be one of the worst named tools in all of physics, renormalization group theory, or RG theory for short. Yeah, it really paints a picture in your mind, doesn't it? You know when you're up close to a TV and you can see all the little pixels, but as you step away, your eye blurs over them and you see the larger picture? Well, that's basically all renormalization group theory is. It's the mathematical formalization of zooming out and blurring over the little details. As you can imagine, relating microscopic things to macroscopic things as you zoom out is extremely important in physics. And RG theory is at the heart of the unification of gravity and quantum mechanics. Uh, here though, we'll just be using RG theory to make some coffee, which personally I think is more important anyway. As awful as I think the name is, RG theory only really involves two simple steps. The first step is called coarse graining, which is the equivalent of our eye smoothing over the tiny details. I'll uh, leave it up to you to decide whether or not this entire video is all just one big pun based off that name. To perform the coarse graining, we'll take a block of 3x3 three three tiles. If the majority of the tiles are grinds, we'll replace the blocks with one big grind tile. And likewise, if the majority of the tiles are water, we'll replace it with one big water tile. The idea is that replacing the block of nine tiles with one big tile is the equivalent of smoothing out the small fluctuations, which is what your eye does as you zoom out. The second step is the rescaling step, where we just scale everything back down to form a new grid. When this is done, we've completed one zoom out, which we can repeat over and over. So we take our coffee, coarse grain it, and renormalize it. These extra tiles that you see flying in are just because of limitations with rendering. In order to do many coarse graining steps, we need to start off with really, really big grid sizes, ideally infinite. Needless to say, showing everything everywhere all at once would be too intensive for my computer, so I'm essentially just coarse graining them off screen and then bringing them in to get the final result. In the back of your heads though, you should imagine everything as one infinite grid that we just keep zooming out of. After we're done the rescaling, we just keep repeating the procedure over and over. Let's go back and see what happens if we're below the critical point. As we keep zooming out, the number of water molecules is on average greater than the number of grinds. This means in the coarse graining step, the water tiles will, over many iterations, take over the grain tiles. Notice that in this new grid, the ratio of water and coffee grinds is not the same as the original grid. Renormalization has created a new effective density, and at each level of zooming out, we'll have a new density. On the other side of the critical density, the same thing happens, but in reverse. If we have a grid entirely of water or coffee grains and we zoom out, the renormalization won't do anything. We'll still only have water or coffee grains. We call these two configurations the renormalization group fixed points. But this is potentially a little bit misleading. The fixed points are not the grids themselves, but rather the densities 0 and 1. It just so happens that at those densities, there is only one possible configuration. While this seems like a pedantic point, it will be important in a moment. The application of successive renormalization creates almost like a flow in the effective density towards one of the two fixed points. Which one it ends up at depends on which side of the critical point the starting density was at. But if that's true, what happens if the density is exactly at the critical point? Which of the two does it flow towards? Well, as it turns out, neither. If you've ever heard of fractals, there's a relatively good chance that it was because of the Mandelbrot fractal, with its distinctive patterns repeating no matter how much you zoom in. Of course, the Mandelbrot fractal is beautiful and all, but it sets unrealistic societal expectations for what a fractal should look like. Not all fractals are identical as we zoom in and out. A more general definition for a fractal would be that no matter how much you zoom in or out, it's statistically the same. In the context of our problem, this would mean that the effective density of water and grinds doesn't change as we zoom out. Now though, we can rephrase this more precisely in the language of renormalization group theory. Fractals represent the third fixed point of the zooming out procedure, and they occur at the critical density. 
If we start off with an arrangement of water and grinds that is fractal, then no matter how much we renormalize it, or in other words, how much we zoom out, it will always be a fractal. There is no characteristic scale of water or coffee grind clusters that can dominate the other, and so the effective density doesn't change. It's always fixed at the critical density. This is why I wanted to make it explicit that the fixed points correspond to the densities and not the configurations of water and grinds. Unlike the zero and one densities, which only have one associated grid, the critical density has an infinite amount of associated configurations that the RG procedure can transition between. If we start somewhere that's even just slightly off of the critical point, renormalization will propel it towards one of the two extremes, never to come back. This is just like what we saw in our previous graph. Every line that was not associated to the critical point always went to one of the two extremes, regardless of how close it was initially. So to finally put it in the most precise wording, we can say that fractals are repelling fixed points of the zooming out procedure. If nothing else though, I hope you agree that these just look pretty. Granted, it doesn't have the structure of the Mandelbrot fractal, but I feel like there's something oddly real looking about these. To me, there's the beauty that comes from knowing that these just simply arise from randomly placed tiles. But why are these fractals important in the first place? As it turns out, these fractals are universal features, independent of the superficial details of the problem. Obviously, this might not be immediately clear why it's so important, and this video is getting quite long as it is. For now, I hope I can at least hint towards just how immense the implications for this are, and leave the evidence for another video. We already discussed how many real-world phenomena feature a critical point. But at the critical point, we know now they must be fractal. And because these fractals are universal features, it suggests that there's some sort of underlying mechanism that is independent of the superficial complexities. And that perhaps the same model we looked at today, where we just thought about water spreading through porous grinds, could be used to study complex real-world phenomena, like forest fire spreading, disease spreading, information spreading in the brain, veins spreading through the human body, branches spreading from a tree, and so much more. The concept of criticality, fractals, and universality is such a powerful tool because it unifies all these seemingly unrelated physical phenomena, many of which seem like they were too complex to study with math. What's most interesting is that we get all of this just from thinking about what makes a good cup of coffee. I said at the start of the video, simple is not stupid. And I hope now you have an appreciation for how true this is, not just in the context of this video, but in everything that you do.